So Whistle Stop tour through some papers, um, as others um, for Sophie and Grace. We're not going into the deep dive into each of them. We'll save that for your journal clubs, but this might give you an idea for some journal club articles you might want to cover. I know I'm talking about subspecialties, and actually before I start, a huge shout out to the people who know who they are, but I got a lot of help from a lot of subspecialists who were answering lots of text messages about what is the latest and greatest. Um, the respiratory team tried to claim this. This is really general paediatrics, but we're looking at um, asthma in teenagers. This article, most of my articles are within the last year. Some of them are a little bit um, older, but the practice has changed in the last year or so. So this is the efficacy and safety of as needed budesonide formiterol, which is uh, Simbacort in adolescents with mild asthma. So this is using, instead of using, you know, your Ventolin or your Cellbutamol as you need it with everyday steroid, this is looking at a long acting beta agonist with steroid in it. So every time you're giving yourself your, as re, your um, PRN dosing, you're getting a dose of steroid at the same time. I've broken my papers down in the PICO method. For those of you who do journal clubs, um, you would hopefully be familiar with this. So your population studied, the intervention, the comparison and the outcome. For this study, uh, the population were um, teenagers with mild asthma. The definition of mild was mm, in that they, uh, in the lead-in period, they had to be using their reliever medication at least three times. The intervention, as we talked about, was the steroid and the long-acting beta agonist as needed. So when they got their symptoms, they used it. The comparison is a bit confusing. And actually, going back a step, this paper was extracting data from two separate studies that also involved adults, if that makes sense. So there was a Sigma-1 study that looked at, has had as the comparator, comparator to Bertuline, or I always say that wrong, to Butylene, I don't ever use it, which is, think of that as Cellbutamol. So that's your short-acting beta agonist. Um, and then they also had the steroid and the uh, long-acting as needed and then the maintenance. So it was a three-arm study. Uh, for Sigma-2, they just looked at the steroid, the differences in the steroids. Then they combined all of it, pulled the adolescent data for this paper. So I will go through that a little bit because it's a tiny bit confusing. And their outcome was severe exacerbation rate. And similar to what Grace was saying, their definition of severe was a bit not what I would call severe. Severe included anyone who got oral corticosteroids during the study period, which, you know, they didn't even have to come to hospital. So, um, but it also included hospitalised patients and those who came to emergency. Um, and there were 889 patients in this. Again, bear with me because this is... Um, a little bit confusing, but I will hopefully make the bottom line really clear. So sigma one was three-armed, and you can see from the blue uh, line that the patients who did not get inhaled steroid at all, so who just got as needed short-acting beta agonists, so as needed terbutylene, uh, their annualized rate of severe exacerbations was much higher. So what sigma one told us was we need steroid. Okay, so from now on, I'm going to talk about the Sigma 1 and the Sigma 2 data combined. So in that, they looked at as needed. So again, um, when you got a symptom, you got uh, your long acting and you got your steroid at that time and you didn't have any maintenance daily steroid. So they compared that to a group where they had their, you know, twice a day steroid plus to butylene when they needed it. And as you can see from the second bit, there wasn't much of a difference. So there's a few things that I'd say about that. One is that within the study, it was a bit more of a perfect world study, if that makes sense. So in Sigma 1, they got twice a day electronic prompts to give their as-needed steroid. So they had a 75% compliance rate, which isn't great, with twice daily text messages. So you can imagine for your teenagers, if you say take a puffer twice a day, regardless of whether you've got symptoms or not, you're probably not going to get the compliance that they got in this study. Sigma 2 was a bit more real world and their compliance was 50%. So even though they were similar in this study, um, they're pros possibly not similar in real life. Um, and as opposed to taking a puff when you've got symptoms. So the group that 
took the puffer when they had symptoms had the same outcomes. So what they did, what was interesting to me, was they achieved the same aims. So again, if we go back a slide, if there wasn't much of a difference, but they achieved it with a quarter of the inhaled steroid dose. And when they looked at things like height, so this was over a year, this study, there was a difference in height. I don't know if it was statistically significant, but it was there in a large study. There was nearly a centimetre difference in height. So the, as the regular group uh, gained 3.9 centimetres and the one that had the quarter of the dosing, so who just took steroid when they needed it, were 4.8. So 4.8 versus 3.9. Now that might not matter. You know, if your average height and you're like just less than a centimetre difference, that might not matter to you, but that might matter to our short kids who become short adults and that might matter if it's cumulative over many years. So it's something to keep in mind in an area of new, um, new research. This is a shout out to have a look at the new asthma guidelines on the PIC guidelines. So the PIC Pediatric, I think it's Improvement Collaborative, is the, basically the new, what was previously the RCH guidelines. They're becoming increasingly nationalised um, and we're now calling them the PIC guidelines. They have changed, okay? We've been doing asthma for forever, right? And nothing's changed much in that time. They have changed. So have a look at them. And a few things that I wanna point out is that again, this type of therapy, which we call smart therapy, is being recommended for teenagers. The other thing that has really changed, and I'm completely biased and I'm happy about this, but most people are really unhappy about this, is that all of those preschool wheezes, you know, viral induced wheeze, ventolin responsive wheeze, reactive airway disease, yada, 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 that we all gave an asthma management handout to, but called by lots of different names, out with that. If they've got a wheeze and if they're responding to Ventolin, we're calling it preschool asthma. <laughs> um, look, it's very controversial, but basically asthma outcomes, it hasn't been working. Trying to, um, and, and I'm not a respiratory physician, but trying to categorise in all of these different ways hasn't changed outcomes. And if you're admitted, at least in Melbourne, if you're admitted to hospital with preschool asthma, all of those other names, you've got a 30% chance of being readmitted within a year. So we've got to do something different. Enough of that, let's move on to my next paper. Okay, infliximab for intensive, this is a pretty quick one. Infliximab for intensification of primary therapy for patients with KD and coronary artery aneurysms at diagnosis. Going through the PICO, I know she doesn't meet like, she doesn't meet criteria quite, it was the best picture I could find. So this is a study of children who had KD, who had coronary artery aneurysms on initial echo with a Z score of greater than 2.5. They either got IVIG alone or they got infliximab as well as IVIG at either five or 10 milligrams per kilogram. And their outcome was the regression of coronary artery aneurysms at two months. In terms of numbers, the numbers weren't massive. This was a really long study. This went from 89, 1989 to 2020, so it was a retrospective study um, at a single hospital. So observational and looking backwards, so obviously that comes with some, this is, this is a sort of study that should inform us, but probably needs further research. Um, but what I thought was important was it wasn't that a child could come in and on any day of the week potentially be, get one or the other treatment. This was sort of a change of practice over time, if that makes sense. So initially, their standard was just to give IVIG, then their standard was to give infliximab at um, five milligrams per kilogram, and then infliximab at 10. Did they show a difference? Yes, they did. IVIG alone, just over 50% regression. With the smaller dose of infliximab, that increased to just over 60%, although that was not statistically significant. What was statistically significantly different was IVIG with infliximab at 10, when over 80% had regressed at two months. So it's tricky because I want to say, you know, it needs a bigger study, but if I've got a little baby in front of me with coronary artery aneurysms, I think this will change my practice. The next study, a Zempic, slightly controversial. <laughs> so once weekly, semaglutide in adolescents with obesity. The PICO, oh sorry, I saw people taking a photo of that. Do you want me to go back just for one moment? Okay, <laughs> all right. In terms of the PICO, 
These were adolescents who were obese or overweight, so obese with a BMI of over, I think, 95% or overweight, which was over 85% but with an associated medical condition. Ignore the second half, they only recruited one patient who was not obese. Um, they gave weekly subcutaneous semaglutide for 68 weeks versus placebo, placebo injection once a week. That's not very kind, but anyway. And their outcome was a percentage change in BMI from baseline to 68 weeks. Baseline data is important. When we look at a randomised controlled trial, we assume that the groups will be equal just because of chance. Um, sorry, on the wrong slide. Uh, just because of chance. Um, the groups in this were slightly different in that the, um, the group that got the semaglutide did have a slightly higher weight at baseline, so potentially could have lost weight slightly um, more easily, but it wasn't, it wasn't massive. For each of the groups, the average weight was between 100 and 110 kilos at baseline. They did lifestyle interventions in both group and they had groups and they had a run-in period of lifestyle interventions and they had to still meet the criteria at the start at the end of that run-in period. Did it make a difference? Yes, it, it absolutely did. So there was a percentage change in BMI of a reduction in 16.1% in the semaglutide group versus the placebo. Reduction of body weight of at least 5%, 73% of that reached that in the semaglutide, semaglutide group versus placebo. And actually, I think it was 37% lost more than 20% of their body weight. So really significant differences. Um, they sh showed an improvement in a lot of other markers too. So, sorry, I'll go back one. So glucose levels improved, cholesterol levels improved. Um, there were some side effects, so nausea, this works by reducing appetite, so it's possibly unsurprising that there was more nausea and vomiting in the semaglutide group, but similar numbers dropped out in each group, 4% in one and 5% in the other. Um, there were um, some gallbladder side effects, some cholelithiasis in the semaglutide group, I think five patients all together, so that's something to watch. But they only followed these kids up for seven weeks after stopping the semaglutide, which is a massively interesting thing to me. Um, and as you can see, there was already some rebound in weight gain at that point. So interpret this with caution. I've spoken to our local endocrinologist. To my, my understanding is they're not currently using this um, for obesity, but they have used it for a very small number of patients with type 2 diabetes. Of course, that's if you can get it because the influencers have discovered um, semaglutide and there are lots of uh, skinny people on TikTok who are advocating for it and the supply chain completely dried up for a while there. All right, I'm gonna rocket through my last one. So uh, this study was published last week or the week before, so it's hot off the press. Um, hand, a mouthful of a title, so I won't try to say it. Um, but if we look at the PO for this one, there was no comparative group. It's not a randomised controlled trial. These were infants with epilepsy or complex febrile seizures who were newly diagnosed, who had trio genome sequencing where it was available, so the child and both parents where that was available. And they looked at the feasibility, the diagnostic yield and the clinical utility of doing this testing. They had 100 infants. For 43%, so one caveat before we go back, before we go back, this, um, they excluded uh, babies where there was, um, I can't think of the word, but you know, if there was a stroke or if there was a, a reason, a non-genetic reason that had caused the um, seizures. Um, so 43%, to me that's massive, identified a genetic diagnosis with a median turnaround of 37 days. These were in some big hospitals, so this was Great Ormond Street, Boston Children, Sick Kids and RCH in Melbourne. 56% informed treatment. So they had a treatment change due to identifying the gene. So this is huge. This changes the pathway for these kids, in my opinion, and I suspect will become standard of care for young babies with new seizures. Bronchiolitis. It's our bread and butter, um, but this is specifically talking about bronchiolitis in ICU. I saw the title of this paper and I 
went, oh, yeah, we know the answer to this question, right? We all know steroids don't work in bronchiolitis. We all know inhaled adrenaline doesn't work in bronchiolitis. But this was a study that combined the two and looked at it. And there had been a pre-existing study from Canada that had shown a trend towards a difference if you use the two of them together. Um, slight bias in that this was a Melbourne study, although I didn't know what was happening at the time. But anyway, um, so the PICO is that uh, the patients were um, babies, late, uh, babies aged less than 18 months with bronchiolitis who needed positive pressure support. And they defined that as um, high flow, CPAP or intubation. They gave them high doses of corticosteroids. So first of all, IV corticosteroid, then oral steroids for six days. So a lot of steroid versus inhaled adrenaline. Um, and the C was, the comparator was usual care. And their primary outcome was the duration of positive pressure support. And they recruited 211 children. Did it make a difference? It did. So the time on pressure support, and, and there's a few caveats to this. So the time on pressure support reduced um, from you know, nearly 40 hours to about, I think it was 26, 27 hours. That um, was, in the actual just high flow group, it didn't make a massive difference. In the mechanical ventilation group, um, you can see it went from about 37 hours to, it went from, sorry, about 68, 69 hours to about 37 hours. That's a lot of time to be not intubated for. But I have to caveat, and I haven't put the ends there, that's my fault, sorry. Um, the mechanical um, ventilation, they did have a generous handful of patients, but not enough to reach st statistical significance. So for mechanical ventilation, so these are the intubated patients, you can say there was an impressive trend towards a clinic or a trend towards an impressive clinical difference, but it wasn't powered high enough to say that that wasn't due to chance, if that makes sense. The RSV positive group, and this is interesting because I think they were the ones that truly, truly had proper bronchiolitis. There was a definite difference, um, statistically different, in my opinion, clinically different. So the babies went from, you know, around about a day on positive, uh, went from, sorry, a couple of days on positive pressure to a day on positive, positive pressure. That makes, that's a difference. But stop, this was an ICU study. There was not a difference in length of stay. So this was about reducing support in ICU. It didn't change the overall trajectory of the illness. And I don't wanna see people doing this out on the wards. I also think, in my opinion, that those six days of steroids was completely unnecessary. Once you've stopped the positive pressure, stop the steroid and see how they go, in my opinion. Um, but if you are working at a center where you've got a really sick bronchiolytic baby and you want to get them to a tertiary center and you've got to wait hours and hours for help to come, I suspect that that will be something that may be recommended for you to try or that you might want to try. And it's certainly starting to happen in our intensive care. I'm right on my time. I'm gonna go through my rapid fire. These, these are like one sentence papers of things that are happening that you should know about. Rizdaplam is changing the face of SMA. So when they looked at this study, 30% um, of the babies who got this treatment could sit when no babies, at 12 months, where um, previously no babies could sit at 12 months if they had this as a diagnosis. And survival without um, the need for permanent ventilation at one year was significantly better. Trikafta, this is a few years old now, but trikafta for cystic, and I keep calling it trifecta, I've had to practice lots, not saying trifecta. Trikafta for cystic fibrosis, complete game changer, in my opinion, looking at this study and looking at how it's being used currently. What's really relevant about this is that this, um, was up in about a year ago it got approved on our pbs from ages 11 up a couple of months ago our pbs has dropped that to age six so for families this used to cost them twenty thousand dollars a month and now we're paying for it and it's going to change the face of cf and i'm going to finish with a fun one so in this study they had children and adolescents with functional pain and they gave them a placebo versus nothing but they told them it was a placebo. And they told them this, like they told them what a placebo is. They didn't just say this is a drug called placebo. They said this is a placebo and there is no evidence that this will work. 
or you can get nothing. Small number of people, but anyway, they put them into each group and then after three weeks they crossed over. So if you were getting the placebo, you went to getting nothing. And if you were getting nothing, you went to getting the placebo. And it made a difference. <laughs> so um, they had, so the patients who were getting the placebo almost halved the amount of rescue pain medication that they took. But I don't know how to incorporate that in my practice, but if anyone has a good idea, because I just can't do that. <laughs> so if anyone has any good ideas on how we might manage that conversation, um, great outcome, but slightly dodgy conversation with families and parents. Thank you very much. All three of us are happy for questions.